ಓಂ ಮಂಗಳಂ ಗುರುದೇವಾಯ ದೇವಿ ಮತ್ರಿಕ್ಷ ಮಂಗಳ ಮಂಗಳ ಭಕ್ತ ಬೃಂದೇವಿಯೋ ಸರ್ವಲೋಕಾಯ ಮಂಗಳ ಓಂ ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಚ ಧರ್ಮ ಸರ್ವಧರ್ಮ ಸ್ವರೂಪಿಣೆ ಅವತಾರ ವರಿಷ್ಠಾಯ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಯ ಮಂಗಳ ಓಂ ಸರಾ ಶಿವ ಸಮಾರಂಭ ಶಂಕರಚಾರ ಮಜಮಶ್ವರ ಚರ ಪ್ರಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಂ ಓಂ ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರು ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುದೇವ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರೇವ ಪರಂ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ಭದ್ರಕಾಳಿ ನಮೋ ನಿತ್ಯ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ವೇದ ವಿರಂಥ ವೇರಂಥ ವೇದ ವಿರಂಗ ವೇರಂಥ ವಿಜ್ಜಸ್ಥಾನ ಶ್ರೀ ಗಣೇಶ ಶಾರಡ ಗುರು ಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಜಯ ಮಾ ಜಯ ಮಾ ಸೊ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಆರ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸಸ್ ಆನ್ ದ ದೇವಿ ಗೀತ ಒಂದ ಶ್ರೀಮಾ ದೇವಿ ಭಗವತ and so today after many many months we and many verses many hours of discussion we've finally got to to get the we will finally get to hear the devi's voice right or at least read of the gods hearing the devi's voice right and so this is in a certain sense where the devi gita some some renditions of the devi gita actually start will start the text here so this is where the devi first speaks and the first question is asked right and and we st- we uh, more traditional the most common is the starko we started with um um uh shiva withdrawing from the world when sati left left her body and uh, and the gods losing their position and going to do austerities um so we usually include that that part other there are some existing uh volumes of the devi versions of the devi gita that start one or two chapters before that with the description of the um other well, anyways oops. some lights i'm having some light probe struggle here but um but anyway we 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 started so some people will start some text will start the text will assume this the text starts with these verses right with the with the with the devi beginning to speak and the first questions being asked so i'm going to go to the uh text here last week we read some verse that we finished with the final verse and i didn't have the graph forgot to had to add the graphic of the final verse i simply read the final verse so just for the sake of consistency to having so having it on these classes i wanted to show the final verse we read uh last week um namaha pranava rupaya rupayoe namo hrim kara murtaye nanna mantratmika yoyete karunaye namo namaha hail to her as a, who in the form of the syllable om hail to her the embodiment of the syllable hrim the hrilaka mantra we discussed in previous classes to her composed of many fold mantras that is to you the compassionate goddess hail hail or we, we bow we bow to you again and again hrim murte um namo namaha we bow again and again so just for the sake of completeness and to have it as part of the record and also those of us those of you who are in the class as soon as we finish this um uh, we only have a few more verses of chapter 1 so then all and then our my graphic will be complete so i'll send you all you have access to the original um i guess by now it's how many pages it's probably like 70 pages <laughs> 70 page graphic we have going on right now so I'll, i'll put it on the on the student pages so you can have it for your own records built to see the devanagari and see some of the the pictures and some of the other quotes that have been added so this is where we are today the painting i'm emphasizing is by that um uh uh dipta art uh, uh argya dipta argya dipta car i think the dr argya dipta car um we've shown lots of his art and if you want to in order to point to point to his art on facebook you can look under art argya right very important uh, beautiful uh website of his of his art on facebook art argya on facebook um a bengali artist and a sanskrit uh a, um, a scholar in bengali tantra a shakta tantra and so i love i love like his paintings very much because each painting is based upon verses many of the verses come from the devi bhagavatam because he's on a very nice series of bhavaneshwari maybe four or five paintings maybe more now maybe at least five paintings on bhuvaneshwari and this is described this picture is describing a different visionary experience what the gods see when brahma vishnu and shiva send in another part at the end of the uh, at, 
not at the end, anyways, another part of the Devi Bhagavatam, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva ascend to the highest, to, to the money dweep, the jeweled island of the goddess. And this is what they see. You can see them. I don't know if you can see in the lower corner here, there's Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva looking up and seeing her in the jeweled island. This is part of the, the, the journey to the jeweled island. And so I've used this because this the one this verse describes she who dwells in the jeweled island. This is the, the, the one of the epithets of 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 of, of Bhuvaneshwari, the goddess of this text. Itistuta tada devyer mani dvipari vasani praha vacha madhura madurayo maduraya uh, matta uh, matta kokila uh, nishva nishvana iti stuta tada devyer having thus praised the goddess iti stuta tada devyer thus praised the goddess but the, after thus praising stuta the goddess a devi right then um 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 tada then right so after uh, praising the goddess something happens what happens right the uh it says mani dvipa adivasani right so mani dvipa the mani means jewel dvipa means island right and adivasani vasani means dweller adivasani means like original dweller or primary dweller ruler of something like that it can be taken this way so uh, uh, adivasani so we spent sometimes describing a little bit of the 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 mani dweep uh, realm and the different ideas of the of 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 the supremacy of the supreme reality of the goddess and one um she is in this text shown to be the supreme brahman the non-dual or formless brahman right uh, um previous verses she is a that and the thou right we went to that she is the, the indicated the one that's indicated by that by tat and the tatvamasi she is the brahman Right, but she's also her has a supreme iconographic iconic form, um, um, uh, as as the supreme ruler, as the supreme goddess ruler of the universe, Bhuvaneshwari, and there it describes where does she, where does supreme ruler rule from? As Brahman, she's the foundation of everything. She's everything, right? As this as Bhuvaneshwari specifically, she has a realm, a heaven world. Right, her highest uh, heaven, uh, Mani Dweep. We've had some discussion of this already, but it was along many, many, many verses, many verses ago. Right, when, when, if you remember, when the gods were in struggle, were in such uh, struggle, they went to Lord Vishnu, and Vishnu said, told them, "Why are you in anxiety? The, the Divine Mother is a wish fulfilling tree. She dwells right now in Mani Dweep." Right, I'll have that verse. I'll, I'll, I'll recite the verse or remind you of the verse exactly in a moment. In a moment, right? So she dwells right. She's dwelling now. She exists now, right? Where in Mani Dweep? So that's an idea that the high. And then it describes in other chapters of the Devi Bhagavatam where what is Mani Dweep? Mani Dweep, of course, this is a text on the supremacy. This this text asserts the supremacy of the Devi. It's a, it, and also it it uh, uh, um, uh, it asserts. One second here. I'm going to stop share just for a second for some house cleaning. Some house cleaning. Okay. Problem. Oh, there's a little bit of glitches on my screen. I had to fix. Um. Uh, <clears throat> so it describes. So it's 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 described. It's known as money dweep. It's not it's as Sarva Loka or the highest or the greatest of all lokas or realms. And it describes because, because it is higher or greater or above or superior to such a loka, which is the realm of Brahma, to Vaikunta, which is the well, the, the world of the realm of Vishnu. And in this text, which is the Puranic text, on par and in the the the, the circle of 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 um a Vaishnava text also and in competition to the Vaishnava text. Um, um it also says higher also than Goloka because in the Vaishnava in the um uh, uh Krishna centric bhakti text Vaishnava text by uh, Goloka the realm of Krishna is above even Vaikuntha the realm of Vishnu they have a whole ontological theology 
of, of, of justifying that. So this is, this, the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam asserts that actually the, the highest God is Bhuvaneshwari and the highest realm, which acts as an umbrella over the universe, over countless trillions of universes, over even Satyaloka, Vaikuntha, and, 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 and Golok, Goloka, Gokula. Therefore, it is known as Sarvaloka or Manidvipa. That's one verse, one line in just translation. So she is the dweller of the highest heaven. Manidvip is also a reference to, um, um, from the Tantric tradition, we understand Manidvip to be a reference to the Sri Chakra, right? And in the final chapters, maybe the very final chapter or the penultimate chapter um, of the whole text, um, a detailed description of the of the um, of the of Manidvip is given. It's very beautiful. Um, there's no really clean translation. The uh, Swami Vigyanananda's translation, it, it lists, you know, 300 trees and 700 herbs that without translation. So we don't, it's very hard to visualize what's described there, right? Um, and I was very excited because the, the Menon translation is a nice, it's a very complete rewording, cleaned up, easy to read, m not many super important things left out translation. But unfortunately, this whole chapter is simply left out. Right, so um, it'd be very nice to have it to, to meditate upon because it describes in the false tutti the the every some chapters have a false tutti the ben, even the whole Devi Gita will have a false tutti one who listens to Devi Gita with face of attention, um, um, hearing it from the guru or speaking it to their disciple or to their son or to a, to a worthy person like that gets this benefit right there's a fault the benefit a verse describing the benefits of a practice or something like that so in the in the the false tutti of the description, the final chapter is describing the, the description of the of the Manidvipa. It describes many, many benefits of even hearing this text, right? And from my own experience, by even in translation, even in an unclean translation, we we regularly we have it in a long time, but we used to we used to regularly recite it out loud, right? We put it on a on it's like we do a recitation of a text. We put it on a on, a, on an asan with a cloth, and like during special occasions. Um, um, especially when something was being built, right? When it's like like when we when we were doing the expansion for the temple room, right? When I was when we were building my uh, actually even I think when we were building the room I'm in now, at a certain point when the the foundation was set up and before the walls went up, right? As Prakash and 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 Madhuri were 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 still measuring and putting things together, things like that. I was here. I was on a concrete slab here. Um, a reading, reciting this text, because it says where because it's describing the goddess's realm, right? And so, when you're building something, you're building the goddess's realm. There's a correspondence, right? You're invoking the goddess's realm while you're building, right? And then when you do that, when you re when you recite it or read it out loud, you really get to hear. If you know something, I mean, uh, there, there's nothing more bewildering and complicated than the three yantra, right? But if you know, if you're familiar a little bit with the the uh, the three the three yantras uh, organization, as well as like maybe a text like the Kargamala Stotram, where you where you hear some of the deities that are in the three chak that are considered in the three yantra, that names 147 such deities or something like that. Um, there's billions of deities in the Sri Yantra, but these are considered important ones in the different angles and corners and petals like that. It's like, oh, they match. Not a hundred percent. The Devi, the Devi Bhavatan description of the of the of the Mani Dweep is not exactly like um 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 the the the, the three chakra, but it's enough that people know that it's it's ref it's describing the Sri Yantra. It's describing the Sri Yantra. You do we think a Sri Yantra is the abode of Tripura Sundari? Right here in the Bhagavatam, it's in the in the Shrima Devi Bhagavatam, it's the abode of the supreme, the goddess who's really Tripura Sundari is also known as by her original supreme name as Bhuvaneshwari, right? So the tree chakra is her realm. And it describes also all these different like um uh, um enclosures, like their the outer walls and how high they are and how long they are and what they're made of, and then that next enclosure, what's in that enclosure, what type of plants grow there, what type of gems are there, what the walls are made of. And if you have, 
the 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 uh, a key to to under, inter, interpretative interpretive key. You we you can recognize those. Or some have they've been recognized as also corresponding to parts of the Sri Chakra and corresponding. Although the the connection is not obvious, but there are but there are connections as well as with the chakras. And there's a tradition of, of associating with the different enclosures of the three chakra with different chakras, right? And I know when I was first introduced to these texts and to the, the worship of the Sri Yantra, um, um, our teacher actually described, he says, if you were to, every chakra has a yantra in it. And there's an elemental yantra, each, there's a different uh, earth, fire, water, air, earth, water, fire, you know, it goes, the different chakras are parts of different, and each one has a yantra, and there's deities within those uh, uh, chakras that have their yantras. So he said, if you were to stack those yantras, and they are stacked, I mean, they're in this unit's mind, and if you were to look down, right, from the top aerial view, or a, 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 what do they call that, a, a, a drone view, right, looking straight down, right, of just the yantras in our in our chakras, this particular, I mean, I've I've tried to do it mathematically. I don't think exactly works, but the idea is that you'd see the Sri Yantra, right? That's one way of understanding it. Uh, although it doesn't exactly work out, but that's the idea that the, the body itself is a Sri Yantra. The Bindu in the Sri Yantra is here, right? And and the the mula the uh, the Bupur the square is a Muladhar, right? That's our that's, so you can see way of understanding. It. And in the worship of the Sri Chakra, as you're worshiping different enclosures of the of the Yantra, different uh, um, levels of the yantra, we sometimes met it. One of the one of the methods of contemplation. There's many methods of contemplation of Sri yantra. This is one that that is common. If 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 methods of contemplation of the Sri yantra is common, this is a common one. Um, um, <clears throat> you identify the yantra that you're worshiping. Maybe the we worship, you know, crystal crystal yantra or metal yantra. Or uh, your, uh, you, with the geometric image with the 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 physical image of the yantra, and you identify that with the goddess herself, the, the as Lalita Chubrasundari or your Bhuvaneshwari or Makali. You also identify different parts of the yantra with parts of your own body. So, so while you're worshiping this part of the yantra, you think, oh, this is Vishuddha Chakra, and this part of the yantra is Nagda Chakra, and this one the yantra is 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 in, in Swadhisthana Chakra, like that. Right. And you also associate it, meditate by contemplation um, with different aspects of the goddess, her expansiveness, right? Um, um, her um, um, the, as moonlight, as, as consciousness, as bliss, and things like that, right? So there's a lot of correspondence and, and, and correlation um, um, between parts of the Sri So in the description of the, of the, of the, of, of um, Mani Dweep, Right, we're describing when so when when Vishnu tells okay, let me see if I have the verse I did instead of jumping the verse. Uh, double check nine and ten. So Vishnu, I'm I'm jumping in my notes a couple of verses, but I think I, I don't wanna I don't wanna I'll say it. All right, sorry. Since I lost my 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 um my my app failed horribly that I usually use for my notes, so it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh yes, okay. In in verse fifteen of 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 the chapter we're on, Vishnu said to the gods, "Why are you so worried?" Right. For the auspicious goddess is a wish-fulfilling tree. Dwelling in the jeweled island in Manidweep, as the ruler of the universe, means Bhuvaneshwari, she is ever attentive. So that is the big revelation. Right there in that in the story, in the text, Vishnu acts as the guru. Right? The gods are in anxiety. What do we do? They go, they go to Vishnu, the guru. Often Vishnu acts as guru, and in some of these te in Shakta texts, Vishnu is often the guru. And and um, um, we sometimes taper that to be, you know, Vishnu is also a code for, I mean, it's the, the supreme deity, Vishnu, right? But it's also a code for, can be a code for consciousness, your own consciousness. If you ask your higher consciousness or the, your inner, the, this, the message, this message can also come. <clears throat> what he said is, why are you in anxiety right now? 
right? The 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 the, the auspicious goddess is a wish fulfilling tree. I mean, she'll bless, she'll grant anything you want, right? And she and where is she in the jeweled island, right? She's right now in Manidweep, right? And she's ever attentive, which means she's looking at us right now, right? She's she's waiting for us to notice her, right? Where in the jeweled island? So how do we notice her above the material world, above the astral world, above above Satva, uh, Brahma Loka, Satya Loka, Vaikunta, and and Goloka into into a a a a a jeweled palace that has um, um, hundreds of uh, many has eight different layers of walls, each eight miles tall and thousands of miles long, with fierce goddesses. In some of them, has fierce goddesses with thousands of of, of soldiers and weapons uh, pointing out, saying, "Kill them, burn them, cut them asunder." In other words, not letting you in easily. Right? There, there's guards keeping people out of this jeweled heaven. In, in the description of Manidweep, right? So the say is like, oh, why are we why are we worrying? Don't we know that right now, in a universe, a th in in a heaven world, inconceivably above our inconceivable, our ink, ilk, inconceived <laughs> uh, un uh, heavens, right? In in uh, uh, in in an, in an un in unattainable, unaccessible realm of the goddess of the transcendent goddess, right? She's right there. Right. So that can also be the me. Of course, it can be she's there. If we call her, she'll come down, which is what she does. Right. That's also the great mystery. Right. The the the, the call from below and the and the merciful response from above, as Arabindo famously said in, in the opening verses of the mother. <clears throat> but um <clears throat> but the Manidweep, Manidweep is also right here. Manidweep is in our own body. So she's right here in the highest heaven. Where's the highest heaven? In the body. Or above the body could be here, right? Or in the heart, in the center. And the bindu, the bindu, the dot, the yantra, goes. It's not. It's not right here. It's everywhere. The bindu from the top to the bottom. So it's a way of conceptualizing that she's in the center of our being, not in a particular place in the heart or in the top of the head or in the third eye or something like that, right? She's in the center, right? She's or in the as a foundation. She's a foundation of our being, right? She's right here. And also this universe is a Sri Yantra. The Sri Yantra or this universe is Manidweep, right? So she's everywhere, right? So, so what Vishnu is telling, we can understand how we interpret it, is that why are you worried when the, the auspicious Bhuvaneshwari, the, the ruler universe, is ever attentive and, she, and she's a wish-fulfilling tree who will satisfy, grant all of our needs and desires or, or whatever our heartful desires are. Right. If we go to her, where is she? She's right here. She's within the body. She's everywhere in the universe. Right. She's in every particle. Right. She's and and also she's also Bhuvaneshwari, who lives in the, in in her own heaven world. Right. And that heaven world is also attainable and um, communicable, communicatable. Right. We can we can call up and get a response from her personal form also. So this is a great mystery. But this is this is this is the one who dwells in Manidweep, right? And so, and, and also I think part of the the the, the sweetness of this the Mani, Man, uh, uh, Manidweepadi Vasani name, right? You can take that as a name. She who is the dweller, the original dweller of the supreme dweller of, of the jeweled island, right? It's also, it makes it, she doesn't lose. Bhuvaneshwari has a quality of rulership, right? And so, and we've talked about this is, that she's an intimate mother. She's the ground of being. She's a source of all these different definitions of mother. But she's also here more like queen mother. She's also the ruler, right? She's the 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 sovereign, the sovereign ruler of the universe, right? And and it it adds the idea of her in a jeweled island in, in her own uh, palace, right? Uh, attended by her attendants, right? Um, um, adds to the the royalty and the and the the dignity of her station. But if if in her highest heaven world above Vaikuntha and Satyaloka, right, she's in a palace, sitting on a throne, attended by her attendants, uh, um, uh, uh, served by her attendants. When she's, if we take the money dweep to be in our own heart, where's her throne? Right, her 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 throne, her her palace is our body. Her throne is the heart or the center of our being. You know, not the more heart muscle, but the center of our being, the, the, the center of our spiritual being, right? And who are her, and she's being served by whom? 
by her attendants. Who are her attendants? Right then we get to this, and this is a, a, a theme in, in in some schools of Tantra, um, um, is that that her attend that she exists at the core of our being as consciousness. Remember, she in our previous last week's verse, you are known as Tat and Twam. You are Brahman. You are the one that's indicated by the word Tat, meaning Brahman, and you are the word indicated by Twam, meaning the visual soul. That means she's consciousness. She's such as not she's consciousness. We are consciousness, right? Then who are her attendants? The body is her attendants. The senses are attendants. Our thoughts are her attendants. Our emotions are attendants, right? Um, um, there's some beautiful um, um, uh, um, poems and verses. Swami Lakshmanju, the great Kashmiri uh, saint and master, he would quote these. Um, um, and he said, he, and there's one verse I, I don't have it in front of me. I, if I thought of it, I thought about what I was going to say a little bit ahead of time. I could have, I have, I know where it is. It's in the, it's part of the recitation verses that they that the disciples of Swami Lakshmanju do, and we have those um, um, as part of his puja. But it, it describes that the that the senses, the like their Shiva is supreme is a Shaivite tradition in, the, in this particular form of Shaivism, a Kashmir Shaivism, where Shiva is supreme as consciousness, and the de and all the senses are the de are devis who worship him, right? So they go out searching for the best things. Right, so they go out. What are, what are they heard in order to, to to offer the best quality ingredients to as worship to their Lord Shiva, their con the consciousness. Right, so they go out and what is that worship? It's experience. They're going out to experience and they're touching, smelling, trying to find the best smell, right? You know, and and, and are the best taste or the best feel touch, right? And so it's an interesting way because sometimes we problematize, right? human our human system right you know it's like oh i it's like oh my god i have thoughts right that's a big problem in my spiritual life or i have feelings oh my god you know feelings of an almost human nature we may say you know <laughs> right uh, 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 uh right uh, um and we make those the big problem of our spiritual life and i mean there's a great value in control of thoughts and feelings and emotions right uh, uh, controlled things powerful things controlled bring a lot of power Right, and therefore yogis control and direct uh, their thoughts, feelings, emotions, experiences, desires, like that. Right, but they're not bad. Right, not only they're not bad, they're the servants of the Devi who's enshrined in our own, in her throne, in on her throne in her palace in her world. Right, as uh, the sovereign of her of her world, which is this world, is also our world. Right, so it's another way to think of it, also. Right. Um, um, she and she sits. And so if she sits in the highest heaven, she's she's attended by her devis. If she sits in our body, she's attended by her devis. Right. If she sits in the world as consciousness or as the world itself, she's attended by her devis, which is a, a all of her manifestation. You can look at this whole world as a big throbbing worship, worship machine. Right. The divine mother's expression. Right. Sri Ramakrishna did this. He um, I was just reading a few days ago. Um, where he uh, he he we forget sometimes. I mean, we know Sri Ramakrishna was a priest at the Dakshinishwar time, but he was a priest at Dakshinishwar. He was a a he was a staff priest. He got a, he got a, he got he got paid, right? He got he got a, uh, a certain piece of cloth every month. He got part of the food. He got a certain amount of rupees into his account. You know, he was a, a staff and he did puja. And so part of his job, Sri Ramakrishna's job in his early years as a staff priest, is to pick flowers for puja. And so he'd go out and pick and pick and go into the gardens, the beautiful gardens, and and important uh, holy plants. Like at that Trinishwar, he he pick um, the bivla leaves, the bell leaves. He he pick um, he pick uh, hibiscus flowers and different types of flowers for them. As you do, I do it every morning. Also, I go out and pick. You know, after my bath, we get ready. We first and we go. We pick flowers for the puja as part of the worship. Right, is picking flowers. Right, but he saw one day. He saw. He felt. He saw. He experienced. Right. The, he said that the, a cosmic worship was going on, right? The plants that were flowering, the flowers themselves, the, the hibiscus plants were 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 offering the cosmic deity, the Virat Purusha, right? They're doing puja to the cosmic deity, right? She's everywhere and everything's worshiping her, right? She's in Manidweep being served by her attendants, sitting on her throne in her palace, right? She's Which means she's everywhere and everything is worshiping her, right? And he said at that point, he stopped picking flowers. Right. You know, he had that vision and other people. Have, I mean, the flower puja had to go on with flowers. Right. <laughs> right. Because that's puja. But so is picking flowers and offering them on the shrine. Right. That's also puja. Right. 
but he that 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 experience overwhelmed him so much so that he stopped he he couldn't interrupt he couldn't pick flowers right and swami brahmananda also made a comment sri ramakrishna's disciple he says when you see a plant i i take this because swami chaitrananda uh, uh revered swami chaitrananda who just re returned back from india today after uh over a month in india um um he told us years ago, right, because of Swami Brahmananda's statement, don't just, when you see, don't just go out to the hibiscus bush and, and strip the plant of all the flowers, right? He says, this is what I'm going to say, because the plant's doing puja, right? So, and you're also, do, we're also doing puja with the plants. I mean, it, we're also fulfilling the plant's desire to offer, right? He says, pick a few from a few plants. Don't pick the, and don't pick the ones in the front. If there's, a, if there's other ones you can take, let the beauty of the plant stay intact. Right, respect the cosmic puja going on to the cosmic Devi, right? And so that's, of course, with puja, we think of flowers and incense and perfumes, so we think all these nice things. But actually, this is true of everything, right? You should, and therefore, we should, we should, we should tread very respectfully and lightly with everything if we have this vision, right? You know, uh, um, not to interfere with much, right? And let the puja go on, right? But still do our puja. We still have to do our puja too, as well as see the cosmic puja going on. So this 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 statement, she is a wish fulfilling tree. She's an ever attentive. She's the 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 auspicious, benign, supreme goddess Bhuvaneshwari, and she exists um, uh, in Manidweep, in her jeweled island. So this verse, let's go back to our verse. Let me find the screen share. Okay. Thus prayed by the gods, she who dwells in the jeweled island. So this remember this Mani Dwipadi Vasini, right? Praha vacha madhu madhuraya maduraya matakokila nishvara nishvana right praba vacha maduraya then she spoke um vacha madhuraya she spoke she, she spoke words very sweet words right and actually trying to my uh, um um uh, sanskrit uh, grammar and vocabulary is limited and but I'm looking at one thing I couldn't quite exactly catch is this mata, right? I don't know what the mata means because I know sometimes mata is a short a. Sometimes, anyway, they, it, there's it, it could mean intoxicated, could mean sweet. I'm not quite sure how that that term. If anybody knows, you can put it. Let me know so I can correct my own um, um, uh, notes, right? I like that word for word for my own contemplation. That's the way I think about these things. Mata, I'm not quite sure, but ko ko kokila is the word kokila is a type of bird, the cuckoo bird, right? So I think he says the joyous tones of the cuckoo. So I mean, Ambikananda, are you there perchance? Um, I am here. Okay, we're gonna give this is our. I'm. This is a mystical city. Whoop, whoops. Oh, wrong one. I'll try uh, again. Okay, hold we, on. Okay, hold on. We, <laughs> I don't know how to do this. Uh, here. Um, oh, maybe you should bring you should bring your phone over here, and I'll call you. Okay. I'm coming. <laughs> Sorry. So Swami Ambikananda has a very auspicious uh, a phone ring on his phone, but because it <laughs> backfired up, we felt like good. Uh, where are you here? Swami <laughs> Jeet. This will work. <laughs> you have oh. to turn. try again? Okay. I mean, okay. <laughs> so that says his phone ring is a cook an indian cuckoo bird the kokila <clears throat> and it's a very beautiful sound of course it has a, a um um like when we talked about the bubaneshwari's iconography she has jasmine flowers and her 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 lips are red like bimba fruit and her eyes are the uh, shaped like lotus flowers and her teeth are like a line of um of pearls and things like remember all that these very poetic excuse me 
very poetic um, um, descriptions. <clears throat> the 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 so similarly, uh, they all have. Thank you, thank you, so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, they all have um, 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 <clears throat> based upon uh, Indian aesthetics and poetry uh, standards. So the the coquilla bird or the cuckoo bird is also very auspicious, very beautiful. It also has a romantic sound to it, right? Maybe not to our ears, but but you know, it's like it's like hearing um like hearing a peacock in the distance. If you've ever been around where where, where peacocks are calling from, and you can imagine, oh, in Vrindavan was Krishna, right? The sound of the peacock and late at night or early morning or the sound of the flute. You know, the, these sounds are are intoxicating in their own way. So everything about Bhuvaneshwari is intoxicating. The sound of the cuckoo is also considered romantic and and full of longing and beauty and like this. So, but I want to give a little, it may be not exactly the sound of a peacock, but but uh, yeah, the poetic idea. So, so thus prayed by the gods, she who dwells in the jeweled island, then answered in the sweet, joyous tones of the of the of the cuckoo, not the peacock, the cuckoo, coquilla. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so we're anxious to know what she says, right? But I want to take a few seconds, um, um, a few minutes to kind of go back we talked early on in the our earlier discuss our earliest discussion when we first started this text we introduced a few ideas i just want to bring them back because here is an example of it right and so this is what of course this is a story right and, and we we can take it literally like one point the gods did tapasya had a vision of infinite light became god who initially become overwhelmed offered prayers that happened to be from the rig from the rig veda um 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 uh, and then uh, the goddess appeared and spoke to them with a voice not dissimilar to the sweet sounds of a cuckoo bird, right? <clears throat> but we could also take them also not this not just literally or maybe not literally. To, and some people take these things literally, uh, but you can also take them liter literarily, right? You know, you have to take it within within the text itself, liter literarily. So the gods are having a vision right of the goddess of divinity the highest goddess right and now not only not only having a vision of the goddess an experience the vision experience of 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 the of the of the infinite pillar of light right or the infinite uh that is something that's a type that's a certain category of peak um mystical experience right and then another level of having a visionary experience right of 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 a goddess a very specific goddess Right now, they're having an audition, right? Uh, uh, which is an aud auditory experience, they're actually hearing the voice of the goddess, right? And in the story, they're experiencing that. We can also people also experience. I mean, people. The story continues, and the and people jump out of people. We jump into the pages, or the page, or the stories jump out of the pages. But we're also there are there are also devotees who have had seen infinite lights, or described claim claim to have seen. Are reported to have seen infinite uh, pillars of light who have purported to have seen um seen or, or at least purported to have seen uh, uh, uh visions of the god of goddess gods and goddesses right <clears throat> and have also had reported to have heard the goddess or god speak right <clears throat> so it's not just for some people it's not just an ancient story or an ancient history, or or an ancient or or, or uh, a, a literary uh, um, um, device to give teachings, right? We, we can, it's, it's all those things and can be all those things. I'm not denying that it is or can be those things, right? But for some people, this is this is a description. This could be a description of of a type of spiritual experience. Where, where and so if we we. We uh, uh, we if you know the life of of Sri Ramakrishna, especially during his sadhana days, right, and his own description of his sadhana days, right, he himself describes almost almost word for sometimes not just almost sometimes word for word what's described in verses we've already seen so far, right. Um, um, many experiences, um, um, like for instance the cosmic puja, the cosmic worship going on is one example, but also of of literally seeing goddesses sometimes he said he had visions in his mind in his mind his mind's eye other time he saw visions he said was my open eyes right so it's another category of vision right and um um 
And also he said that, and, and the, the divine mother would speak to him, not just metaphorically, right? Although sometimes it's that we could say sometime, oh, the mother spoke to me. Some, no, literally, I went to the temple and mother spoke these words out loud to me and told me, don't listen to him. What, what you're saying is true or, or giving some instruction or, or, or giving permission. Right. And of course, we come time, oh, we, we don't know what to do. We go to the temple and we get we feel we get a we get a response in the moment, we get an answer. Right. That's one type, and that's a that's a intimate, uh, maybe even a profound intimate religious experience. Uh, um, um bordering on mystical, perhaps, when we have that intimate relationship, we feel we get a response. But this is a different claim. No, no, no. Like he said, Oh, I saw Tripura Sundari come in front of me and speak these words, or Radha appeared to me and told me this. You know, things like that, you know, that, that's another level, right? And so how do we, so it's one thing in the text, of course, we can take the Katamrita and the Lila Prashanga, the text of the Ramakrishna tradition, right? Also in the same, these are, these are, we can take them literally, we can take them figuratively, we can get inspiration from it, right? But this, but this is Sri Ramakrishna's historical character and he's claiming to, he, the records are him saying that he experienced this, right? So I think this is really, I'm challenging. Right and exciting also that these things can be directly experienced. Right, um, so the, there's a term we use in theology, a, a, a theophany. A theophany is when an experience of of God, right, a, a, a experience of, of God. Experience the appear. Theophany is like an, it's the appearance of a deity, and it's a vision or audition of a of a, of a deity, or um, uh, um, is considered a theophany. And the place. Sometimes where it happens is also so, so God appears not only in a vision, but also appears in or as a place, a holy place that's charged like that, right? And then, so theophany is an encounter, um, um, usually uh, usually private with a deity or claimed encounter with a deity, sometimes also public. Sometimes it's more than one person. Like you look at, you know, there's a theophanies of, of people ex a claiming experience and vision of the Virgin Mary. So that's exciting and wonderful. We love the fact that that the Virgin Mary either is appearing or people are seeing her uh, by her grace or people's spiritual exuberance. Both of them, I think, are glorious in their own way. They may they may or may not be the same thing, right? Um, um, but sometimes you have experience. We have examples where like seven children or six children are seeing the vision at the same time. You know, so sometimes it's and so in this story, it, the claim is that the gods together saw the goddess, right? You know, of course, it is literature also. As I said, literarily is not just literally because even to see one of the gods would be an overwhelming religious experience for most people. What to speak of the gods themselves seeing a high god? So we, we'll take it this way. Right, and maybe there's another term we don't. It's it's a little awkward in language. A theophany is a, a, a theophany, right? So uh, the, uh, means means the vision of the goddess specifically, right? Not just uh, of a god or the goddess. And then in our in our other courses, as part of the seminary, in our Hindu goddess course and some other, we've mentioned um, Iliadi's idea of the hiriophany, which is rather than uh, which is the encounter with the sacred rather than making it a personal deity theosophy is usually with a, a a god a god or god or a goddess like that so he uses hiriophany um uh to encompass a wider variety of religious experience right so like uh, um, um not just an experience of a, of a of a of a personal deity right so other types of overwhelming encounters with the sacred where the sacred enters into so his definition is a sacred entering into human experience, right? So I think that's a good, uh, good working definition of a, of, a, of the type of mystical potential potential mystical experiences we're describing here, an encounter with the sacred. So how do we take such experiences, right? We could. <clears throat> We've mentioned in the past this 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 um, uh, ref there's a way of phrasing something like and uh, and there's a, we have to if I were to say oh last night I dreamt that God spoke to me right so that's profound and if I had a, a, such a dream right I'm sure I would take that dream very serious personally very seriously right if I were to then turn around and say actually God spoke to me in a dream. Right, not that I dreamt that God spoke to me, which is what I know, but God spoke to me in a dream is is a 
a pretty um, um, bold interpretation of the fact that you dreamt that God spoke to you, right? Because now you're taking it, you're taking not just as a personal uh, a personal experience that may be profoundly significant and taken very seriously, but now it's like, no, like God speak, God spoke to me. And very often be, behind that sentence is then and God told me to tell you this or something like that, or I'm very special by this, you know, sometimes. And, and somebody that God's speaking to, we would consider very special, right? People who dream or that 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 God's speaking to them, we'd consider that a to be deeply, profoundly, spiritually significant experiences for 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 any devotee or spiritual aspirant. But somebody that God's actually speaking to, we take that on another level, right? And so I'm always a little nervous with people claiming wording their spiritual experiences without the what I call ontological humility, you know. Uh, 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 um, but Sri Ramakrishna would speak that way. Now he didn't say, "Oh, I dreamt that God spoke to me," right? He said, "No, he, Ma spoke to me. I asked her, and she told me that she." Oh, and he said, "You know," and he say these things, and his disciples would look at him like, "Like, how do we make sense of this? These are not things to say, right?" But they said, that, "But we trusted him, right?" Because there's a term called "apta." You know, he's he's trustworthy. He's a reliable source, right? And and there are uh, standards in the scriptures uh, when people make statements like that. Who it's what's a reliable source? Our own, are we a reliable source when we have such experiences? Can we go beyond, can we go from, I had an spiritual experience to, I've ex, um, I've had experience, experience that in the spiritual category of, 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 of profound internal personal relationship uh, experience, a uh, 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 spiritual experience to what, because I've seen it, I know it's true. Not just personally, I know it's true for everybody. Right, it's that 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 jump, right? Uh, a mystical experience is evidence of an external, uh, 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 independent reality. A person, a subjective experience is is evidence of the, of, a, of, a, of an objective reality, right? I think is more complicated. And eventually, I'm contemplating. I think uh, we're finishing up our um, our first year of our first year is taken three years, but our first year courses for the seminary, our introductory courses. Our second year courses are a little bit more on the theological uh, nature, and I'm one of the things I really want to talk about is like mysticism in general, right? Hindu mysticism specifically, and we can talk about these things, dedicate whole classes perhaps to some of these questions about the validity of truth claims for mystical experience. But in in general, Swami Vivekananda believed that uh, um, and argued for that that a religion that a that a mystical type of experience of a non-physical reality, right, to, for which no physical evidence is possible. There's no physical evidence possible of a non-physical of the non-physical reality of the spiritual reality. That's one claim, right? And therefore, if there is evidence to, in in the Vedic tradition, the evidence is the Vedas of non-physical reality, that which you cannot prove or know about through physical sources, you can only know about from divine revelation, right? But by, by the visions of the or the revelation of the sages of the eternal Vedas. That's a big foundation of so much Hindu orthodox conception of how truth works, how known truth works, right? So Swami Vivekananda argued, broke from certain Vedic tradition, uh, interpretive traditions, and he argued that that the sages who revealed the Vedas, they were mystics. Just like today, we have mystics, and there's it's not just the Vedic sages. There's sages everywhere that are mystics that are experiencing the non-physical reality for which there's no physical evidence for. There is evidence; it's spiritual evidence, and the spiritual evidence is in another category of experience. And he gave the argument like you wouldn't like you 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 wouldn't um, look for uh, evidence of, of astronomy, astro astronomical proofs. In bio, in in chemi in chemistry, you use a different category. You know, it's like each each field has its own um, uh, uh, method of, of 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 verification, right? So, so spiritual uh, uh, reality has its own field of verification, not just accepting the Vedic revelation. That's one thing. Why do we accept the Vedic? Because the saint the, the sages had mystical experience, just like. People all over the world have mystical experience, and just like we can have mystical experience, right? And so, do we trust our mystical experience? I'm going a little off topic, but I think that's important because uh, we're about to jump into a lot of philosophy as the Devi begins to answer philosophically 
complicated questions of the gods, you know. I want to cover this as, as our takeoff point or revisit it. <clears throat> so they what they experience, I'm sorry. So sorry, we can under, I mean, this is fleshed out, I mean, in, in so many different ways in different places. But but one of the points is that if the information we're looking for can only be, this is also the, the, the Vedic standard, the Vedas are proof, are evidence of what? They're only evidence of things for which no other evidence is possible, right? You know, if 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 um if if regular physical observation is necessary, you don't need the Vedas to tell you the trees outside, right? You know, the the Vedas talk about reveal Brahman and Atman, not trees, right? So um, um we don't need the Vedas for that, even though the, the word tree may be in the Vedas. That's not the purpose of the Vedas, is not to reveal that there's trees. We don't need the faith. We don't need to. We don't need the Vedas to tell us that there's trees outside, right? And they're they're not. They're, uh, uh. And if the Vedas told us there's no trees outside, our senses show there's trees outside. So we take, oh, that's that's a poetic expression of the Vedas. We don't take that as as literally true. This statement like that. So it's an interesting thing. We could also other religions um, could I think benefit from this method of interpretation. Also that that uh, uh, um, we don't need scripture to tell us what's what we can discover through our own sense uh, uh, investigation, right? So the object should be something that for which there is no other method of, of, of verification. And then we have to think whether or not our experience is, is uh, trustworthy. And so the question is like, are we hallucinating, right? Are we mentally unstable when we're having the experience, right? Um, um, uh, does it correspond to what the scriptures say, what other people have experienced? Things like this, right? And um, um, uh, like if like if if I'm taking a known hallucinogen and then having a hallucination, so that, then my experience will be taken as a hallucin uh, could easily be taken as hallucination, hallucination, right? And hallucination may be profoundly significant and 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 life transforming, right? Personally, life transforming, but it it doesn't offer a lot of, or maybe I would say almost almost no evidence of an external reality. It's a, it's a subjective experience that by definition. Is a subjective experience does not prove and it does not not evidence of subjective reality, right? So if one is not hallucinating, one is not prone to to um, to exaggeration, to to mental unclarity. One is healthy. One is the ego is not out of control, looking for attention. Um, um, all these, you know, all these you can you can test like that. And generally, in general, we may we should be able to trust um, such uh, 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 such ex experiences, right? But we should still be humble about what we're claiming, right? They may be uh, there. It's a type of evidence for non -or for non ordinary reality or non -or non ordinary not non, non physical reality, spiritual reality. Um, but um, uh, um, it's personal proof, right? And I think of the fact that others have experienced it adds evidence, even if we haven't experienced to its reality. The fact that the saint, like like I know, like oh, like this Kali exists. Maybe she's just a myth. And she is a myth, right? And she is a tribal goddess. She is a tribal goddess. You know, you can describe all that. But Sri Ramakrishna also, also claimed, I spoke to her. I'd see her. I'd play with her. I saw her on the balcony of the temple with her hair flowing in the wind, right? How do we take that? You know, it's like, I take it very seriously, right? That such a being, such a reality is, is real and can be experienced because he's opta, he's trustworthy. He himself was wondering, Am I going crazy? Am I are my experiences correct? Am I am I mentally unst un unstable? Right. And then his gurus came and showed him in the scriptures. Bhairavi Brahmani showed him the scriptures. No, and and uh, and explained all of the experiences that oh you've experienced is mentioned in this tantra. What you've experienced here is mentioned in Chaitanya Bhagava, Chaitanya Mangala. Right. This was experienced by Chaitanya. This is described in this text on Radha. Esoteric text on Radha Tantra also describes this, you know. He says, Oh, I'm not crazy. Right. And so he began to trust his own experience. And we also, following his own, uh, the, uh, we also have learned to trust his own ex his experience also until we get our own experience. So, anyways, okay, let's do, we don't have much time. I'll just do a little one next part of the next verse here. Let's see, the goddess has to say something. I could stop there, but the goddess has to say something after all that. So what De Sri Deva Devucha? <laughs> Somebody turned on their 
Sorry, uh, Guruji. Yeah, we turn that off again. Uh, Sri De so the god Sri Devi, he's described Sri as the blessed goddess, Sri Devi Uvacha, De Devi uh, Devu Devu uh, Sri Devu. My tongue is not this. The goddess can speak. I'm, I'm speaking in cuckoo, the sounds of cuckoo birds. Also, the goddess said, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. My tongue might working. Vedantu vi, uh, vidhudha karyam yadhartha mihai sangataha varadaham sada bhaktya kamakalpa druma smicha. O Vadantu, tell me. So the first thing the goddess says is a question, right? So it's interesting. We pray to the goddess often for questions, right? But she starts with a question. Tell me, oh gods, oh wise ones, right? It says, uh, vibhuda means a very wise person, a wise people. So wise beings. And why are they wise? Of course, they're gods. Or their rishis or devotees, whoever the, the gods are represented here, or if it's us, if we put ourselves in a position, we are wise enough. Why are we wise? Because we've gone to her, right? We're having a spiritual crisis, whatever our spiritual crisis is, right? They're having a spiritual crisis, and we're probably also having a spiritual crisis. And she asks, like, Kariyam, Kariyam Yadhartaha. Yadhartaha means why. What is your purpose? What karya karya uh, karyam yadartaha? What is your purpose for coming together? Why are you here? Right. Sangataha means brought together. Why have you been brought together? So this is a beautiful question. Of course, it is somebody like, if somebody comes to you and you ask, so well, why are you here? But it's not just somebody. This is a group of gods that have come together with a purpose. Right. And so I was thinking, you know, because one of the things we should, one of the ways we can approach text is to ask not only what's being said, but what's being said to us. What are the, what or what does it say to us? You know. So when she says to the gods, "Why have you gathered together? Why have they gathered together? We know why they have. I mean, they describe why they gathered together. That a, a, a Shakti has has withdrawn. Shiva is absent. In that absence." A demon has taken over, Tarakasuda, who's gotten a boon that only the legitimate uh, um, uh, uh, child of, of Shiva will can kill him, and therefore, seeming to be invincible, has has taken over the three worlds and kicked the gods out of heaven. So that's in the in the in the literature what's going on, right? They're having a big crisis. That's a that would be a very big crisis, right? We're also we take this symbolically, we discuss this or, or metaphorically. This is also a bit. We are having similar crises. Right when we don't, when we don't have shakti, sabagya disappears. When we don't see ma, we don't feel ma. Right, even though she's the only reality, if we lose track of that reality, everything becomes inauspicious. Described what is it? The planets retrograded ominously. Right, everything was everything when it seemed to be against them. Right, everything seems to be against us too. And a big crisis. We don't we don't have ma. We don't have shiva. Right, um, and the demons come up. Whatever our demons are, they could be physical tyrants, they could be lust, anger, the, the, the classic list of lust, anger, greed, jealousy, things like that, right? But I think we can update that list also. There's a classical list of the classical period. We can probably update it with our modern psychological experience of uh, of, of of anxiety and low self esteem and self loathing, and all. We can put almost anything in any other. Uh, demon that we could we put our own demon and come up and we need ma's blessing and we go to the guru who is vishnu and vishnu says we have the answer is you need to think of ma you've forgotten ma so you're in suffering right think of ma and your suffering will end that's what vishnu says so what do they do they do austerity they do sadhana right they've gathered to do sadhana because of this crisis right so that's i think what's being said now, what does it say to us, right? So the same question could be, I was asking you know, this, this afternoon, I was typing, trying to create the graphic for this. And, and I was thinking, well, similar question, why are we gathered together, right? You know, uh, in our little class here, 
online, you know, and and or and and or as devotees, as a sangha, right? We we have satsang together, we associate together as as fellow devotees, we study together, we chant together, we go on pilgrimage together, right? We do sadhana together, we go to gurus together, we read together, you know, or whatever it is, right? So for the same reason, I think it's the same reason. Why you gather together is a reason we've gathered together, right? Somehow or another, we don't, we the fact that we're reading the text on the Divine Mother and we, how do, we means we we feel we want to reconnect with her, right? The one who's obvious we're missing somehow, and and the charm may disappear from my life and all kinds of problems come up, right? And and demons come up or maybe we don't have to use such harsh language, but things come up at least, right? And 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 that may spur us not only that she will fix it. But though things coming up bring us bring us to a point where there's there's profound things that we're missing, not just the little stuff. There's the the, the little stuff, even if it's not so little, are symptoms of, of 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 ontological lack of our separation, our conscious separation, seemingly conscious separation from the from the divine mother, right? So this is when she asks, "Oh gods, oh wise ones, I can also uh, why are you? What brings you here? What brings you together?" Right. We can also ask, oh, wise ones, uh, uh, what brings us together? Right. And I think the answer will be the same answer. Then it says, and then she says beautifully, I am a Varadaham. I am the bestower of boons. Right. I can, I remember Ma, when she has four, of course, she has unlimited hands, but generally our image of Kali, two of the hands, there's one like this. And one like this. This is Avaya Mudra, giving fearlessness. And this is Varada Mudra, giving boons. She gives boons. She get, grants what we ask for. Not just anything we ask, right? But if we ask her, she's the one that can give boons. Varada. Varada Ham. Sada Bhaktiya. Kama Kalpa Druma Asmicha. So I am I, I am the grantor of boons to Sadabhakta to, to devotees, right? A wish fulfilling tree. Kama Kalpa Druma Asmicha. Druma Asmicha. Kama Kalpa. Kama means desire. Kalpa means uh, um, uh, uh, um, fulfill. And Druva Druma Druma means tree. So this is I've given an image of a modern kind of Yoga world style art of 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 of, of the, but it's of of the kalpa through tree or the wish fulfilling tree, and the idea that is that like if you want, we've talked about this already, but the the, the wish fulfilling tree is very important and and obviously it's, it's this, this text starts with it, uh, um with with Vishnu saying she is a wish fulfilling tree, and so a wish a, a a tree a fruit tree, gives fruit. Right, a fruit tree can give fruit. So a apple tree gives apples. An orange tree gives oranges. If you want apples, you need to go to an apple tree. If you want oranges, you need to go to an orange tree. That's obvious, right? Right. But ma is not such a tree. She is a tree that whatever you want, that's the fruit we can get. The fruit we want, which she can give us, right? But a kalpa to the tree or a kalpa vriksha, also the the wish. Uh, there's three terms: a kalpa 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 to do kalpa druma kalpa vriksha. Which is like a vine, and there's also uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, there's a wish fulfilling gem. There's all these the idea that there's something which gives anything you wish. It only works, and I chose this graphic because somebody's sitting under the tree, right? You know, it's like it only works if you're sitting under the tree. If you're under the tree, the root, the the the, root, the fruit will come, right? So how do you sit under the tree, right? Sitting under a tree, seeing a tree from it, knowing about a tree is one thing, right? Knowing where a tree is is better, right? Seeing the tree is also very wonderful, how beautiful it is and very exciting like that. But it it's different if you're right up against it, very close, underneath its sheltering branches, right? Uh, 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 within it almost, right? To be under a tree is almost to be within the tree, to be engulfed by, by its canopy, right? Right? sitting under the tree one gets one's desires fulfilled that means you have to get very close almost within maybe close means within 
at the foot of the tree means within the tree, within the, the foliage and protection of the tree, right? And that's what the gods do. They engage in thousands of years, remember our so many verses, thousands of years of sadhana, chanting mantras, reciting hymns, doing yasa, doing pujas and yajyas, uh, chanting the hilika mantra, um, um, uh, fasting, doing dif various difficult austerities for, a for thousands of divine years. Right before they got their first experience, before they, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what they were doing is getting under the tree, getting close. Right when you're close to that, when you're close to her, right then we have nothing to fear. And if we're away from her, if that's possible, we also have nothing to fear because we can be we can be instantly close. Right, because uh, she's everywhere. She's within our body. She's in the world as well as in the highest heaven world. Right, so um, uh, I'm re I'm reminded. Uh, I think I've told this story in this class already, um, uh, but a long time ago, um, um, uh, um, about a disciple of Holy Mother. I won't go into the full story because it's getting late. Um, um, but just to get to remind you of the point, if you haven't, if you maybe remember it, where a disciple of Holy Mother who got TB, right, and um, um, and so when he found out he had tuberculosis, he had a brahmachari attendant, is a Ramakrishna monk. Um, he went into his room and he 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 ate very little food. He went started fasting, eating only fruit and doing hours and hours of japa, right, doing hours and hours of sadhana. And then, um, 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 and then at a certain point, he then stopped that extra sadhana and stopped that fasting, and and accepted the the the. And so people are wondering what he's doing. Is he doing some special sadhana to be cured of tuberculosis? At that time, I'm not I'm not sure now if it's curable, but at that time it was not curable. Um, it was only controllable. You spread, you stop it from spreading, and you give comfort to the person who has it. That's why it was treated in India at the time. Um, <clears throat> but he explained to somebody, one of his uh, devotees, what he was doing. He says that Holy Mother told me, he's a direct disciple of Holy Mother, that if I'm in, a, in, if I ever need to talk to her, what to do? Right. I thought the, what was it? Make statement like that. He says you need to fast, eat very sattvic food, and increase your japa by so many times, right? Because by purifying the mind to her level. Then she can communicate, right? So she can get close. We can always pray to her and accept her blessings, but communication is not easy. It needs to be in the same vibration. So she needs to make his mind. He's already a holy man, doing holy work, living a holy life. But he needs to make bring his mind up to an extreme sattvic level to be able to hear her and to get and basically to ask a boon, right? And it turns out very. I get emotional thinking about it. I think this is such a high ideal. The boon she asked. He asked when he, when holy when he had a vision or some sort of experience of holy mother, right? He says, "I'm an old man and I'm sick. It's no problem. I can die, right? But my attendant, he's a young man. Please arrange it that he can serve me without getting uh, tuberculosis. Don't let him get sick, right? So even his high his high uh, motivation, right, was for the benefit of his attendant that he wouldn't get sick because it's such a such a contagious disease." But the idea that you had to purify the mind to get the response, right? You have, you have to get in order to get. So this is what the gods do: they purify, they rev up their sadhana, they purify their life by by austerities and fasting and and japa and meditation and puja and all and and yas, all the things described, and then they get they they get a response from her. Now they're close to the tree; they're underneath the tree, and now she her response is, "What brought you here?" Now the question is, what 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 gathered you here? Gathered where? Right. It's not just what brought you together to the him, top of the Himalayas to do puja. Now, what brought what brought you underneath the branches of the wish fulfilling tree? Right. Very beautiful. Varadaham, I am the boon. Give, I am the one that gives boons to devotees and calm to devotees and kama kalpa drumasmi. I am, I am a wish fulfilling tree. I mean, my Swami Ambikananda, I showed him these verses yesterday, and he uh, reminded me of a song that Sri Ramakrishna sang, 
right? Uh, just give it's a long and uh, um, uh, it's a complicated song. It's a, definitely with all kinds of emotions going on, and and image is very um, uh, complicated imagery, right? But the first line, we'll just I just wanted to share that first line translation. I mean, I'm beginning on this translation. It's simply uh, come, O mind, and go for a stroll to Kali, the wish fulfilling tree. Right. So, what a beautiful statement. It's like, oh, come. Right? But who is he speaking to? Come, O mind. Right. Uh, uh, Ram, I, believe, I believe this is a Ram Prasad song. Um, um, uh, Ram Prasad says, to whom? To his own mind. Oh, Ram Prasad, let's go for a stroll to Kali, the wish fulfilling tree. Right. So, that's a, this is a very, um, this is the call to sadhana. Right. Uh, 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 let, let, let them, oh, mind, think of Ma. She is a wish fulfilling tree. Right. You're anxious and full of anxiety. Go to her. Right. And that is sadhana. We bring the mind. We purify the mind by thinking and, and hovering and keep tying ourselves to Ma's feet, holding ourselves there. The wish fulfilling tree. The next verse. See here. Oh, sorry. The, I, in my old app, I could just do this. And I could see my next line. The song doesn't obviously doesn't end there. Come on, mine, and go for a stroll to call it the wish fulfilling tree. Current page, side two, um, and and add her root. Gather up the four fruits. Right. So this is a beautiful because we have I mean, many of you probably have fruit trees. We have a, a, a plum tree here, and and we have we have many beautiful fruit trees here. But I'm just remembering the plum tree. And at the right season, if we don't pick them, they fall, right? And so, well, something in the morning you go, it's like it's like, oh my god, we have to, we have to before the other animal come and take them, you know, things that when they fall on the floor, we we first thing we gather at the fruit, we gather the fruit at the base of the tree. These fruits are already falling, right? And so, what are the fruit that falls? The four fruits. What are the four fruits? This is a reference to the uh, chatur purucharta, the the four goals of human life. In our one of our opening in our um, uh, um, our uh, 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 opening class on Hinduism that we gave, um, course on Hinduism, we talked about one of our course one of our lectures was on Purusharta to the four goals of life. And this is Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha, right? Dharma, Dharma, complicated to translate, but it could mean it could mean righteousness, religion. Um, uh, morality, uh, uh, responsibility, justice, all it has a very wide variety of proper behavior and expected be scripturally sanctioned behavior as well as uh, our own following our our duties and responsibilities personally, socially, spiritually like that Dharma, right and then Arta means means um, uh, uh, wealth, right our economic uh, prosperity and uh, fulfilling those needs. Then kama means desire, our desires, pleasure and desires, fulfilling our our, our, desire, our natural desires. And then moksha, moksha means liberation, right? Salvation, liberation, like this. And you can add to that in some of the devotional literature in the Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam, it adds the fifth purusharta as bhakti, devotion, right? Uh, uh, and that there's a emotional reason for describing devotion as separate from moksha. Right, but we could say that for for dualistic devotion, or for 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 people in in some um, um, devotional schools, right, the idea of moksha, real moksha, is devotion. So we just we can combine uh, moksha to be whatever the 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 sociological goal of your tradition or your motivation for your the your parangati, your goal of life, your spiritual goal could be living forever. In in a paradise with uh, the the Lord's pair in the Lord's paradise, it could be union with the essential being. It could be nirvana. It could be he heaven. It could be any number of things like that. So whatever the, the that that's moksha, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. These are the four the four goals of life. The people struggle so much to follow or to so much to attain, right? These are easily attained at Ma's at the at the foot of Ma's tree. These fruits are falling all the time, right? So uh, um, the, there's a famous if you know that book um by um. Houston Smith, uh, it was called the Religions of Man. He rewrote the book some years ago as the Religions of the World, 
right to remove the uh, the uh, gender exclusive language that was appropriate that was in common at his time right but it's now it's called the religions of man or i did it again the religions of the world it's and he's one of the founders of religious studies as an academic discipline in general religious studies but in his chapter on hinduism he talks about the purusharta and he says in hinduism you can have what you want you can get what you want right but every time you get what you want you should we ask what do we really want Right, and the idea behind it is that really what we want is freedom. We want love. We want freedom. We want freedom from suffering. We want we want bliss. We want we want moksha, right? And so even if it's not what we're after, it is really what we're after. And we're looking for 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 happiness, and in 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 the senses, and in the family, and in society, and in, in politics, and whatever we're searching, however we're manifesting our our, our karmas and dharmas like that. Really, what we're look, looking for uh, behind it all is the 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 um, ontological throb of 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 of, of wanting a, a union, right? We want God, um, um, so that's moksha. Whatever we want, we really want moksha. So whatever, but whatever we want, Ma is the source of everything. She can give us moksha. She can give us everything, right? That's the idea. So. What did it say? Uh, uh, I am the I am the ever I am ever bestower of boons. I am the wish fulfilling tree. And it says tishtantyam maicha chinta yusmakam bhakti shalinam samudharami madbhaktan dukkha samsada sagarat. You shine. Find my notes here for this one. Fifty six. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, uh, just uh, let's start with. I'll uh, we'll start with in the Sanskrit rather than English. Um, tishtan, uh, tishtan tyam. Mai, mai, mai. I, mai, I am right next to you. All right. So this is imagine it's like when when we finally get a response, and and she asks us, "What do you want?" He says, "I'm right here. I'm standing right next to you." Right. Why are you anxious? Why do you have anxiety? Why are you worried? And what a wonderful statement. Why are we worried? The, Ra, Vishnu's statement at the beginning, why are you suffering when the Divine Mother is a wish fulfilling tree? Here she's saying, I'm a wish fulfilling tree and I'm right here. In other words, you're at my, you're at my feet. You're at my base. You're underneath my branches. I'm right here. Maybe she's always right. I mean, she not. Oh, maybe she's always right here. But we're, we don't see her right here. We need sadhana to see her right here. It takes. It took them thousands of years of sadhana, right? It will take us a little bit also probably to have this type of. It. Also, it's another way back to our opening ideas about the nature of personal religious experience, right? Such religious experience are not cheap. They come from thousands, thousands of years of sadhana or whatever that is in our life also. Right, it, uh, um, that's one of the th that it comes from from a purification of the mind and heart. Manushudi is required for such to, for uh, spiritual experience. Many experiences we take to be spiritual may be transformative and personally significant, right? But they're not the, they're not always the signs of the purified mind, of a purified mind, like a result of years of sadhana. When Sri, when M first saw Sri Ram, saw Sri Ramakrishna first time in samadhi. The first thing he asked, he said, is it possible that somebody could be in such a blissful state? I mean, he saw him with tears flowing down his eyes, you know, his face, in, 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 in lost in ecstatic rapture. He said, and he, and he says, how many, how many years of austerity, of purity, of, of devotion, of singing, of, you know, is, how much devotion, how, uh, how much longing, how much purity is required for such an experience? That was his initial response, right? So we can see it, we, it may take some years of uh, devotion, austerity, and purity to attain the state where we can have such experiences and take these experiences as uh, 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 um, as profound confirmation of, of 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 spiritual reality, right? Anyways, um, um, you sh it says, "Why are you anxious when I stand nearby?" Tishtyantyam maicha chintaha. And it says, what it says, uh, Yushmakam bhakti shalinam. Your devotion is shining. Right? So in the previous verse, 
I am ever the bestower of boons and a wish fulfilling tree to my devotees, to devotees. And here it says, why are you anxious? You have devotion, right? It's like, I'm the one who removes the anxiety of devotees. Therefore, why are you anxious? You're a devotee, right? You know, so that's a big, a big, a big thing, right? <clears throat> I'm reminded in the Srimad Bhagavatam, I think in the Seven Skanda, I believe. I think that's where the Nishingadev Leela is. I gave a lot of talks on Nishingadev Leela many, many, many years ago. But one of the verses really struck me. After Nishingadev appears and all the gods are fearful, nobody will approach him because he's so fear. Even Lakshmi won't go near him in this version of the story. So they push Prahlad, little Prahlad forward, right? And seeing his fierce form, who's like death, he, uh, uh, who's described as the death of death itself, fearsome, flaming, ready to destroy the universe. He's the he's absolute anger of God, right? God is absolute. Everything about God's absolute. When he's angry, it's absolute anger, right? Very fearful. And and Prahlad says something so beautifully. He says, "I'm not scared of you at all," right? He says, "Everybody else is scared." He says, "Because demons are scared of Nishingadev." Right, you know, you've assumed this form to kill demons and protect devotees. Right, the demon has been killed, and I'm I'm a devotee, therefore I'm not scared of you. Right, it's like it's like, it's like why should I be scared of you? And then he says a beautiful line that I think about a lot. Uh, um, he says, actually, in the future, devotees who are scared will remember this form; they won't be scared of this form in the future. Where you know. Some people are scared of this form in the future. When people are scared, they'll, they'll remember this form to remove their fear. Because you're not this form does not appear to destroy demons, devotees, this person with demons. So similarly, in the version of, of the same sentiment, I bless devotees, your devotees. You're shining with devotion. And what brought them to devotion? It could have been their material anxiety. We can take the, a demon came up like that, you know, whatever the problem that led them to God. Lots of things can lead us to God, right? But more profoundly, if we take the 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 their their cause of of their suffering to be ontological, right? The spiritual lack that we all feel, right? We come to God and we become devotees. We purify when the mind and heart is pure. Devotion automatically comes, right? Sadhana is devotion is um. How do I say? Anyway, when the mind in, sadhana purifies the mind and heart, right, and devotion shines in a purified mind and heart, right? Because devotion is intrinsic to the to the nature of the soul, right? Just like and so to use Sri Ramakrishna's example, like iron, iron is attract an iron needle is automatically attracted to a magnet, right? Doesn't need to do anything. It's it's its nature, right? But if it's encrusted in mud. Or like that, then or it's for it, then then even if you put a magnet next to an iron needle, if it's crusted in, in hard mud, it will not move. Or if you take it far away, it won't move. Or with like that. So wash the needle, right? Or bring the needle closer to the magnet, and you'll the devotion, the longing, or the the attraction of the needle to the magnet, the attraction of the soul, us to God is intrinsic and automatic. And then the next step, I think. Is that devote and then God stands? I've actually written. If you, it's one of the lines and one of the lines that I'm satisfied with the composition of in, in our book, where right? it says that so, the purpose of sadhana is to purify mind and heart. Devotion dawns naturally in the purified mind and heart, and God stands self-revealed in the presence of devotion. Right, devotion is itself. And so this is what happened. They purified their mind and heart. Their and devotion has come. Now. Divinity stands revealed in front of in front of them. Same thing will happen to us. And then she makes her. So why are you anxious when I'm right here, right? You are full of devotion. And then she makes her big promise. Already she set up her promise. I give boons. I am the wish fulfilling tree to my devotees. You're my devotees, right? Why are you worried, right? And then she makes her promise. This is the, one of the first big promises. Right. Samud dharami mad bhaktam dukkha samsara sagara. Samud dharami mad bhakta. 
Samud Tanami means I rescue, right? And the image here is rescuing somebody drowning, right? Samud Tanami, Mad Bhaktaha, I rescue my devotees. In the half verse before, literally half a verse before, you're my devotees. Why are you worried? I rescue my devotees, right? Yeah. And then it says, uh, um, Mad Bhakta, Dukkha Samsada Sagara. Uh, dukkha means suffering. Samsada is this ocean of the world, right? And uh, birth and death and, and, and material life. Sagara means, Sagara means um, uh, ocean, right? So those who are drowning in the ocean of suffering of, mater of the material world, right? I rescue my devotees who are so drowning, right? Who are, who are suffering from their suffering. So I rescue my devotees from the troubled ocean of samsara. Samudharami mad bhaktan dukkha samsara sagarat. That is an underlying verse, right? Uh, 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 I use this term, those who know me, to go for walks of smear, something like that. This is like, when I'm talking, this is my under, there are certain verses like, these are other, when, when, when God in a verse is making a big statement, that that's the point, these are like almost the point here now. The point of all this is this verse, right? Up to this point is this verse. Right, I rescue my devotees from the trouble of some the suffering of samsara. We have to feel like we're suffering in the ocean of samsara, right? The purpose, you know. So if you do, if you're happy in samsara, right, then that's also fine. You can enjoy the world of samsara, right? When one is not suffer, not happy in the ocean of samsara, is dissatisfied with 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 um um the, ma the material world. Right, was the mundane world, the shallowness of the mundane world, not but but and wants to be, uh, and and from the the, you know, and and in classical Hinduism, it's they put it very practically, they put it very bluntly, birth, death, old age, disease, rebirth of an intermittent nature, and the cycle goes on and on, again and again, chewing the chewed again and again, same problem, the same again, you know, so that that idea, and they feel that this the, the ocean of the ocean of suffering is is the ocean of repeated birth and death. That's that's a very Hindu way of phrasing it. It can be phrased in a million ways. If the 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 the, the suffering of the mundane world, right? I rescue my devotees. So she's already she's promised that, and they're her devotees. So what is she saying to us? She's promising us not just the gods in a in a 14th century text or something like that. You know, these this is mentioned. This is a message. The authors of this text, the, the sages who wrote these verses or spoke these verses, this is the message that we, the Divine Mother, who's right here, who's the answer of boons, to, when we have devotion, she will rescue us from the ocean of samsara. There's only a couple, uh, uh, yeah, only one more verse, so I shall finish it off. So we, next. Next week we will see what the the gods questions. They start their questions, right? Iti pratigna pratigna me satyam janita vibhu dota dota maha iti prema kulambanim shutva santush tamana manasaha. Verse seven. Iti, thus. So now the goddess has spoken. That's so what we see what she's spoken. She's big and she's given a big promise. I will save you from samsara, from the from your suffering of mundane existence. Because you're my devotees, I saved my devotees, and now you're my devotees. You were suffering before because you weren't devotion wasn't a shining, right? And and our suffering brought us to God, brought them to God. Can save ourselves. Our suffering brings us to, may bring us to God. It's one way we come to God, right? Uh, but when we're purified, then devotion, real devotion, rises independent of just the causes of our prayers, the reason we're praying. But prayer itself transforms us into lovers of God, and by purifying the mind and heart, by maybe becoming, and she'll use these terms later. You know, by overcoming tamas overcoming rajas and becoming fixed in sattva and then from sattva into into the transcendental beyond beyond the gunas beyond the three gunas she'll herself, herself will use this language in the coming chapters so then it says it um iti thus or this uh 
pratignan. Oh, so she's still speaking. I'm sorry. This half verse, she's still speaking. Um, pratignan me. Prat, pratignam is a, a promise, right? Me, my promise. This is my promise. Thus is my promise, right? Right. Satyam janitaha. Uh, uh, uh. Know my promise to be true. Satya. He's translated sincere, right? Uh, the both of, oh wise ones oh best of the wise ones another way he, oh gods he's translated oh god but it's something like the uh, those who are who are wise right know that uh, this is so this is again ma's promise to us know this promise of mine to be sincere oh best of the gods right so that's her message recap her message before moving on O oh, wise gods, explain the reason that brings you together here. I am ever the bestower of boons, a wish-yielding tree to devotees. You shine with devotion, so why are you anxious when I stand nearby? I rescue my devotees from the troubled ocean of samsara. Know this promise of mine to be true or sincere, O oh, best of the gods. Now, it switches. This is one thing that happens in the Devi. Not all texts do this. Devi Bhagavatam does this, where you don't know, always know where the end quotes come, right? So now it switches. Um, it doesn't say then. It doesn't say Vyasu Vacha, Sri Vyasu Vacha when the 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 uh, narrator is speaking, right? But we know in context that now her her section she stops speaking, and now in mid verse, mid in mid sloka, um, uh, Vyasa the narrator is speaking to the king. Vyasa continued, Iti prema prema kulam. Vanim Shrutva Santushta Manasaha. Premakulam, filled with love, right? Iti, thus, filled with love, Vani Shrutva, having heard these words filled with love, right? So you know, we have to imagine how they were spoken, right? They're spoken with, with, as, as expressions of love. The most intimate uh, uh, being, literally, our, literally the most intimate aspect of our being, the most, the most closest being, saying with great love, "Do not worry, don't be anxious. I will save you, right? If you come to you, you, if you come to me and you have, I will save you." Hearing these words infused with loving joy, the gods were satisfied in their hearts. It says, "San uh, Santushta Manasaha." It means their mind. Manasa means mind, heart, being. Their inner world, right? They became satisfied. Santosh, satisfied. Having heard these beautiful, loving words of the goddess, this promise of the goddess, they became pacified, peaceful, uh, uh, anxiety reduced, right? Uh, satisfied, uh, 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 and 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 uh, in, in their hearts. And then there's a half line that comes. Nirbaya nirjara. Ranja nu chura dukkaham swa kirakam nirbaya. Nirbaya means without fear. Nirjara. Nirjana, it's a nice play. Nirbaya, nirjana. Nirjana is a name, means one who doesn't die. Right? So this is a way of referring to the gods, is the immortal, the deathless ones. Right, the gods don't die in the normal sense, right? But so I think it's also plain, right? Because they be, they became the, the deathless ones became free from fear. What a beautiful line, right? Somebody who can't die, why are they fear? Why are they afraid? Right? To say to call, oh deathless ones, why are you afraid? Right? You know that it, it shows you even in the 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 title deathless ones mean they have nothing to fear, right? The big fear is gone, and so also this is something that's going to be shown as as the verses unfold right that the soul right is is not is beyond time beyond this body not this body right survives the death of this body right it may even not only may it will be you are the that and you are the this you know you are the that and the and and the and the you and the and the top tut and the twum that that who we really are is 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 uh deathless right we so the immortals in the story it's the gods but we're also immortal and the point of this teaching is not just that the gods are immortal. The, the, the teaching is that we're immortal, 
not that the gods are non-different from Brahman, that we're non-different from Brahman, right? That the gods have to attain Padabhakti, that we have to attain Padabhakti, right? The gods have to become liberated, that we have to become liberated. The story is not really about the gods, ultimately. Freed from fear, the immortals described their own ordeals. Swakriyakam. Dukkam Swakriyakam. Swakriyakam. Right? They began to describe their 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 trouble. And so externally there is trouble. A demon has come up, they need her to respond. She'll respond positively to that moon. But then it's not sufficient. She'll the the are the the it goes deeper than that. And so then the, these questions will the on the deeper spiritual questions will come. That will start. We'll cover it. We'll, uh, we'll talk to those next week. Hariyom Tatsat, Hariyom Tatsat, Hariyom Tatsat. Thank you for your kind attention. These are beautiful verses. It's taken a long time to get here. And so we finally hear the Divine Mother speak. And what does she speak? I'm here. I'm yours. Right. Uh, um, and I'll solve your problems. And why are you worried? You never had to worry. Right. And also, you're deathless. Why are you worried? Right. You know, who you really, of course, we're worried if we don't know we're deathless. We're worried if we don't know the truth. So the Devi Gita tells us the truth. And so as these beautiful weeks will come, beautiful verses will, will open up. Continue. Thank you for your kind attention. Jayama, Jayama. Any comments or questions? We went a little late, but I want to finish this little section. Um, we always go a little late. And I always want to finish a little section, but that's my bad habit. Um. We don't, I also have a time limit because we have we have a meeting in India with somebody in India in a few minutes. So maybe one one or two comments if there's any, if there's anybody. If not, I'll have to cut it. Hariyom, Hariyom. Uh, Elijah. Jai Ma, Jai Ma. Okay, um, so I have a couple short things. They're okay. short. <laughs> um, so firstly, I just wanted to ask, can I share a quick story or experience I had like last week? Is it very long? I, 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 Not long. It's very short. Okay, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Right. So I was listening to a talk by um, by Bhagavan Das, right, the singer, mm -hmm. um, and he was just speaking about. He, it's this talk called "God is not a big deal." No. <laughs> um, but he was. There's a line that he mentioned um, in this talk, and he said it was so simple. He said, "Get personal with the Divine Mother," mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, and I, I thought of this because you mentioned the the divine mother standing next to us mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and i remember when he said that all of a sudden i the vision in my head came of the mm -hmm. divine mother just walking alongside me and i remember i was just at my friend's house feeling mm -hmm. anxious actually mm -hmm. and i heard this and i was oh, why <laughs> you know like like it, we should be joyful in this life. And I remember I just like walked out of the room and on my way back downstairs, I did like a twirl in the living room as if I was dancing yeah. with the divine mother because it was just like, yeah. If like, we, what, that, what, a, what a beautiful, actually yeah. uh, something I had had in my mind to mention. I mean, I'm going to mention it to me. So it reminded me and I forgot, but like when she says, why are you worried? I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm your mother right here. Right. This is he some of you reminded me of the Holy Mother made the exact same statement, the very famous statement of Holy Mother, Shadow to Devi. He says, When you're in anxiety and fear, we're like that. Just remember who's who who's your mother. Remember you have a mother. And remember who's your mother. Right? Say to yourself, I have a mother, meaning her. Yeah. Right. You know, so that that's I mean it's a beautiful oh, we read oh how beautiful. But actually, this is this is instruction. This is a sodden instruction. Yeah. Right. When we're in anxiety, say to ourselves, I have a mother. Right, mm -hmm. itself solves a lot of the problems go the way right there, and and the higher solutions will open up from that from that seat, that seat of intimacy, and uh, then we we can go closer. And the other quick, com I, I I won't ask my question tonight because we're running short on time. Yeah, yeah. But the other quick comment I had is when it mentions that the gods gathered together. Mm. Right, I was thinking about this, and I thought about this before when we spoke about the gods. Is the gods being like our body and our senses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right being those different aspects mm -hmm. and when i thought of this the gods coming together it made me think of like um patanjali yoga sutras right and the the process of when we have to become indrawn right 
So it was like, to me, like we bring our mm -hmm. senses and our yeah. thoughts and our emotions together to one point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah, that I one agree. point that in focus that we bring it to is the Divine Mother. So that was- God, that's, that's nice, yeah. What brings yeah. you together could be yeah. a reference or we can see as a reference as the as pratyahara the uh, bringing all the senses to the and 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 then pratyahara also to ishwara pradana with a surrender yeah. we bring everything together <laughs> and focus it on the divine that's very beautiful and about exactly <laughs> that's great thank you om 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 anybody else i think yes, michael I think okay wrong. michael okay yeah. So I saw this symbol on, on two different slides, the uh, a six-pointed star made of two interlocking triangles. And I looked it up, and I, I, I saw that it's, uh, I see it's called the Shotkona, and it can represent the union of Shiva and Shakti. Yeah. Um, was this an intentional choice? Is there? Uh, yeah, so, so, the, so I was, so Bhuvaneshwari is associated with the Sri Chakra, as I, as I, but actually, and every goddess is associated with the Sri Chakra, especially, a, a little historically, and it's tricky because anything I say about the Sri Chakra would be wrong on more levels than it's right, but at least a few levels will be right. Right. Um, um, the Sri Chakra is a very um, exalted and popular, and um, has a, has a lot of weight, you know, and 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 therefore a lot of if you have a tradition where you want to establish your goddess as the supreme goddess of you know it's like you associate her with you can associate her with the Sri Yantra which is the, the king the queen or king of all yantras right so it can do something like that but actually all the different um um god all the different devis have their own yantras even the Lita Tripura Sundari whom who is the most um probably the most connected to the Sri Yantra has her own yantra called Navayoni Yantra right it's nine triangles right all in what not like nine triangles like this one it's like nine triangles like this all pointing down, right? So they have, she has her own specific Navayoni Sodashi Yantra, it's called, right? There is, she has her own specific Yantras, Yantras, right? So Bhuvaneshri has her own Yantra. In that slide, was an, it was a Yantra for Bhuvaneshri mentioned in the, in the Tantras, right? And so that's a, a specialty of, of that uh, Dr. Argya Dipta Kar, right? Who's that artist, the art, Argya artist. Um, um, he, he, he bases his paintings, he puts almost all of his goddess paintings are yantra based. And they include sometimes obvious like that, sometimes not obvious, but it'll include uh, the, the yantra of the deity being worshipped. And often also sometimes texts will be the verses describing the goddess or the yantra will be in Sanskrit around, you know, it's like it does, there's a lot going on in his paintings. But what you, that that yantra, the upper, the, the uh, Ashtakona, uh, the um, Satkona Yantra, the six uh, triangle, very similar to like we think of the star David and things like that, is the most common thing, interpretation of that Yantra is Shiva and Shakti in union. The upper triangle representing Shiva in general, the lower triangle representing Shakti in general, the Shiva Lingam, the Yoni, and from that, geomet geometrically described, that is the expansion of the universe as her as Bhuvaneshwini's realm. So there, it is, it is in fact her Yantra. What you saw there is her Yantra. Specifically, the Bhuvaneshwari Yantra. Yeah. Each of the Dashma Vijas has a Yantra. Yeah. And all of them can be worshipped in the Sri Yantra. That can, that's still a true statement. <laughs> um, all right. I think I'm going to, even I, I'm still grappling with that, but we have other responsibilities tonight. So thank you once again. Uh, Jai Ma, Jai Ma. We'll, uh, next, next Wednesday, we'll continue. And also, you know, on, on the website, on the um, the student group, you know, we have the we have a student group as part of the website. You know, like there's some questions that didn't get answered. You guys can start your own discussion. I can chime in if I, if if you need me. But actually, I know you're all very being very polite, right? By by letting me talk, or or, or I'm being very impolite by not letting you talk, or maybe it's a combination between the two. Right, but uh, our devotees, our collection of devotees here, have so much knowledge and insight into all these things. So, I encourage you all to continue the conversation online um, and discuss these things. All right, Jaima, Jaima, good night, all. Jaima, Jaima, Jaima. Good night, Swamiji. I'm going to say good night, Swamiji. If I'm going to see you in the other room in, in one minute. <laughs> Jai Ma, Jai Ma, Jai Ma, Giri. Jai Ma.
Durga, Jaima, Ramli, who's left, Alex is left, and Elijah's always left. Jaima. <laughs> Jaima, Jaima. Good night. Good night.